First of all, I'm going to invite um, Kat Kruger, who is an indigenous elder, a traditional teacher and mentor from the First Nations people. Um, he is Cayuga um, Gayokoyo, Turtle Clan of the Six Nations, um, and people of the Longhouse. And Kat holds the position of traditional indigenous elder in residence at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, Canada. And today, he is, uh, Kat's going to help us to open the ceremony. Tonsi, Sego, Wena Bojo, Makwa Gishgad and Dishnakashi Kandorum, Kugut and Dunjiba, Kugan Nishnabe and Dao, Miwagaja condition of cars. Ambe Maja Dao, Jibuabi Dab and Genege Gomi Nage Nage Gopa. Miguetra Scobini Kwe, Mimwa Manado Gisus, Manado Nokmus, Mimwa Gichikumi Made Wabo, Miwi Shakana Shishubangi. So the last part means I'm going to speak English, because in this, this room, this is the language that we're going to share tonight. And also, I don't speak Ojibwe, Ojibwe very well. I'm actually Cayugan, Haudenosaunee, which is a completely different tribal group than Ojibwe. Uh, but my elder was Ojibwe, so I like to remember the one that brought me knowledge or helped me learn uh, with those words. And uh, thank you, Miigwech. This uh, little ceremony that we've done, uh, I'll, I'll explain that first. For, for Has anybody smudged before besides me? Yeah. So some of us recognize that. And actually, the fire has been the center of every culture on the planet that's still here. At some point, we all discovered fire, or we wouldn't be here. We couldn't have survived without it. And many of our belief systems, remember, many of our ways of gathering include a fire. And to this day, if you go camping or something like that, or to the cottage, it's wonderful to gather around that fire and talk. There's a little bit of sage that was burnt, that smoke goes up in the air. And within this ceremony, that, that metaphoric washing of the hands, taking some smoke over the head, the eyes, the ears, over the heart, over the mouth, it's saying something. It's doing something. It's, it's bringing us together of one mind. It's doing that in the sense that we say, everything I touch, I'm going to touch with my heart. I'm going to speak from my heart. I'm going to think with my heart. I'm going to look at everything with my heart. Very importantly, I'm going to listen with my heart. And I think when we listen with our heart, that's when things go in here and it can solve a lot of world problems if we all listen with our hearts. So that ceremony, there's that, that, that in a sense, spiritual cleansing of the room. It's not a religious ceremony. I do not teach it as that. It's more an application of philosophy in such a way that we all see, uh, hear, and speak together. There's an old translation that sounds like, all heads the same height. We are all equal. And when we talk in this way, we can come together of one mind, then we can move forward. Otherwise, we end up stuck in a, stuck in a, a place maybe where we don't want to be. We share words. There are people who are coming to speak, or are here to speak tonight, who are going to share their knowledge and wisdom. We consider that a gift. All people consider that a gift. And we look at uh, our old style of doing things, by the way, was, was kind of experiential learning. If you had a passion, if you had something you loved doing, somebody within the village, within the group, would take you under their wing and teach you and show you how to acquire that skill set. And based on their knowledge and their ancestors' knowledge and the ones that had come before them, they passed on that knowledge. We say it's devoting your life to something. So those ones that come here to speak, part of what's happening is they are uh, um, basically devoting their life to passing on, passing on some knowledge. And that's a pretty big commitment. That's a pretty big passion. That's a lot to come from the heart. And that's what we need in this world is things to come from the heart, be kept within the heart. And our memories, you know, when I, I love to joke, when I store memories up here, they don't stay there long. If I store memories in here, they're there forever. And they are there forever. And I act on them that way as best I can. Most certainly I'm not perfect. I learn from mistakes. A lot of our tribal teachings talk about that. So the, you know, I'm Ongohone, I'm, I'm Haudenosaunee, I, I come from people of the Longhouse. 
And actually, Angohone talks about, in English, it translates into people from the swamp. It translates a little bit differently here and there, but as far as I understand it. But what it really means is not the swamp, not that, that place where there's like bulrushes and, and little amphibians. It talks about where the land transitions into water. And it's almost a place that's hard to find. And it's a place within the heart where thought transitions into something that is a passion, something that we carry. And the old style was when you came with a gift to a gathering, we would all sit in a circle. Each person would introduce themselves. And in the language, I said my spirit name, Makwagishkat. It means sun bear. My clan, Dodem, is turtle. So that's my relatives, both physical and spiritual, both DNA and, and philosophical, my relatives. And that I'm also German-English. So I have these different DNAs spinning around inside me, and I have to respect each and every one of those. I can't say I'm only this and pretend I'm not something else. So when I ask my, uh, if you would, if I ask my ancestors for guidance or understanding, or respect and thank them, because without a single one of my ancestors, I would not be here. That piece of DNA would be missing, and I would not exist on this planet. So each and every one of our ancestors have contributed to what and who we are. And we take that knowledge. We take the mistakes as well. So we can say, careful. Careful when you step up here. Don't trip. Be careful what you do. Be careful how you walk, how you talk, how you speak, how you interact with people, and how you bring people together. And that care and understanding is, is, is nurturing. Care is nurturing. And we learn that and respect that idea. So this chance to come together tonight, and for me this chance to even stand here and speak for a moment, is a privilege. It is a privilege to speak and have people listen. And it is a bigger privilege also to be the one listening. And since there's something I hold dear to my heart, although you can't tell because I'm always talking, I'm always lecturing, I'm not learning anything by standing here talking. I want to turn it back to you so I can listen and learn and receive that gift and all that you're bringing tonight. And I appreciate and thank you for that. Miigwech. Hi, everyone. Um, firstly, um, I want to respectfully acknowledge that the land on which this event is taking place is traditional, uh, traditionally the territories of the Huron Vendette, um, Seneca, and the Mississaugas of the Crowded River. Uh, today, this meeting place is still the home of many indigenous people from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land. It is my pleasure to be uh, here with you today um, during the Canadian Multiculturalism Day and to bring greetings from all of us from the Canadian Race Relations Foundation. So, Sri Tetong Kong Tong, Detre Avet, Isi Avet Wu Ajudui, La Jeune Canadienne du Multiculturalisme, et de Wu Salui de la part de la Fondation Canadienne de Relations Raciales. The Canadian Multiculturalism Day has always been an important day for us. This is one of the four Celebrate Canada Days, and it's an opportunity to celebrate our diversity and Canada's commitment to equality and mutual respect. In addition, this year marks the 30th anniversary of the Canadian Multiculturalism Act, which came into force on July 21st, 1988. The Act aims to, among other things, firstly, preserve and enhance multiculturalism in Canada as a fundamental part of Canadian heritage and identity. And secondly, to ensure that all individuals receive equal treatment and equal protection under the law while respecting and valuing their diversity. This year, we also celebrate another approaching milestone, which is the 30th anniversary of the Japanese-Canadian Redress Agreement signed on September 22, 1988. That agreement acknowledged the harm done to Japanese-Canadian Japanese -Canadian community through the internment during the Second World War. And in addition, the agreement also established the existence for the Canadian Race Relations Foundation with an endowment fund of $24 million contributed equally from the Japanese Canadian community and the Canadian government. The CLRF has a charitable status to work on education, research, and facilitating better relations in Canada. As such, we are grateful for the partnership today with the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers, 
in our event to celebrate all these important milestones. We would also like to thank our sponsors, the Ontario Bar Association, GEM3, the National Association of Japanese and Canadians, and many of their representatives are here today. Uh, welcome, everyone, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Uh, on behalf of the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers, um, I'd like to very much recognize the collaborative leadership shown by the Canadian Race Relations Foundation, the Ontario Bar Association, uh, and the National Association of Japanese Canadians in uh, planning this event and making it happen. It's been a pleasure working collaboratively, and uh, I look forward to future opportunities to work together on future projects. Um, I would also, uh, while there have been many people who have worked together to help make this event come about, I really would like to recognize the leadership shown by uh, Executive Director Lillian Ma at the Foundation, as well as uh, Chris Chung, uh, the OBA Director of Policy, who's at the back of the room today. Thanks very much to both of you for all of your help putting this together. Um, I do have a few words to say about Canadian Multiculturalism Day. Um, it really is a timely opportunity for all of us to reflect on the importance of equity, diversity, and inclusion. Um, it's also a very timely opportunity for us to remember our own history and the importance of civil liberties. And I think it's particularly timely given contemporary events happening just south of our border. Um, one darker chapter from Canadian history uh, was the forced relocation and internment of uh, 22,000 ethnic Japanese in British Columbia during World War II. Uh, this really truly was an injustice caused by racism and discrimination. Uh, years later, of course, following lengthy uh, redress discussions with the Japanese community and the government of Canada, uh, we were fortunate to have uh, the Prime Minister of the day, Prime Minister Mulroney, rise in the House of Commons on September 22, 1988, to offer a formal apology and financial compensation for the Japanese Canadian internment. Um, so I think it is a timely um, event to recall. Um, interestingly, um, the U.S. Supreme Court just yesterday uh, in a decision which, uh, in a split decision, upheld the presidential um, travel ban. Um, the, the dissent by Justice Sotomayor actually referred to the Japanese-American internment as a point of comparison for her analysis on the importance of ensuring that countries really follow democratic principles to support multiculturalism and inclusion. So apart from the 30th anniversary of redress and that timely opportunity for us to collectively celebrate um, the redress for that episode in Canadian history, I think it's also very timely for us all to think about the importance of this event, uh, the internment, as well as the redress agreement, given um, the fact that these stories continue to have relevance in, in our uh, in our communities even today. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it back over to Lillian. Our first speaker is Sima Jathalal. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, she, she is the Regional Director General of um, Ontario from Canadian Heritage. She's currently working on a national public uh, engagement initiative in which Canadians will state their, share their experiences of and possible solutions for tackling the um, problem of racism and discrimination. Please come up and welcome uh, Seema. Hello, bonjour tout le monde. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you, Lillian and the Canadian Race Relations Foundation for inviting me and for all the important work that you do day in and day out and all the partners and everyone here who's gathered uh, here today. Thank you as well uh, to our elder, to Kat, for opening us up uh, on a good note in a good way. I, I would also like to begin by acknowledging that we are so lucky to be able to gather and meet and live and work and play on this land. And I think it's so important that we recognize this traditional ter territory and the ongoing uh, 
yeah, presence of Indigenous communities uh, across not only Canada, but Turtle Island at large. Um, so as, as Lillian mentioned, I'm here on behalf of Canadian Heritage, um, and I want to wish you all a happy Multiculturalism Day. Canada's diversity has been at the core of our national character since our beginnings as groups of First Nations, Inuit communities, French and English colonies. And our history has been shaped by our very deliberate attention to this diversity, going beyond navigating its social challenges um, to nurturing an inherent trust and belief in its virtue. Uh, this has produced some pretty impressive results. Canada is now home to over 200 ethnicities and languages, which I'm sure is no surprise to you all, and 20% of our population identify as visibly racialized. All over Canada, our communities continue to grow and to strengthen with that diversity, working with the constant change to build a society strengthened by that inclusion. As former Governor General Adrian Clarkson noted, the society we have built here didn't just happen. It required vigilance, and planning and constant effort, and it still does. Multiculturalism Day is a really good example of our collective work, a day in which we nationally recognize the importance of ensuring that all Canadians safeguard their identities, take pride in their ancestry, and have a sense of belonging to Canada. Of course, the Canadian Multiculturalism Act is another important tool in our kit and is, a, is the main mechanism that the Government of Canada uses to promote diversity and inclusion. As Lillian mentioned, since 1998, uh, sorry, 1988, uh, when Canada became the first country in the world to proclaim uh, a Multiculturalism Act, our government has worked to, quote, promote the full and equitable participation of individuals and communities of all origins in the continuing evolution and shaping of all aspects of Canadian society and assist them in the elimination of any barrier to that participation. So in other words, the Act recognizes the importance of preserving and enhancing the multicultural heritage of Canadians while affirming and reinforcing Canada's commitment to diversity and inclusion as a vital approach to making our country welcoming, strong and safe. So examples of the kinds of things that this commitment has produced include not only Multiculturalism Day, but also the promotion of Black History Month, Asian Heritage Month, the dedication of the National Holocaust Monument, the thousands of Canada 150 events that took place across the country last year that promoted diversity and inclusion, uh, to name a few. Perhaps less obvious might be the impact of the act on how we in the federal government do our day-to-day -day business. Uh, because essentially it underpins our ongoing efforts to diversify our public service and obliges all federal institutions to develop programs and policies that promote and enhance diversity. So the Act is essentially a living document that we in the government work within and report to Parliament on on an annual basis. I don't want to bore you all. Uh, essentially it's important and I'm, uh, I'm grateful to be a part of that and I'm also grateful to be with you all here tonight uh, in celebration of all of our contributions to Canada's multicultural reality. Um, without a doubt, the uh, events of today's world underscore how lucky we are to be a part of a country that prizes its diversity, but they also reflect the fact that it isn't luck alone that has brought us here, but instead a deep commitment to continuing to work together with those differences intact. Now, uh, it's very much my pleasure to um, uh, introduce our next presenter, uh, Justice Mariko Amatsu. Uh, America grew up in Hamilton, studied in Toronto, and earned her law degree at Osgoode Hall Law School. Uh, after her call to the bar, she began practicing uh, human rights law with a prominent civil liberties lawyer. Uh, and she then went on to add uh, criminal law and environmental law to her practice. Uh, and along the way, acted for uh, First Nations communities. Uh, first, to prevent the building of nuclear reactors in James Bay and later to help protect forests across northern Ontario. Um, along the way, America was instrumental, uh, along with other important leaders of the Japanese Canadian community, in working with the National Association of Japanese Canadians uh, to negotiate the redress agreement with the Government of Canada, which was, uh, I can say without overstating things, uh, an exceptionally difficult, lengthy and arduous process, as dealing with government oftentimes is. Um, 
America then went on to serve as chair of the Ontario Human Rights Appeals Tribunal, as well as um, serving as an adjudicator with the Law Society of Upper Canada, as it was known back then. Um, after those experiences, uh, America became the first East Asian woman in Canada to be appointed a judge in 1993. The following year, she published Bittersweet Passage, a book that documented the internment redress negotiations, which won the Prime Minister's Award for Publishing and the Laura Jameson Prize for Best Feminist Book. Um, America's many achievements are way too lengthy to list here, but they do include the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers Lifetime Achievement Award, the North American Pan-Asian Bar Association Trailblazer Award, and the Order of Ontario. Uh, please join me in welcoming Justice America Omatsu. As Mike mentioned uh, in his earlier remarks, uh, two, uh, yesterday the U.S. Supreme Court uh, supported Trump's uh, travel ban in a 5-4 decision. And the dissent of four of the justices, uh, written mostly by Sonia Sotomayor, referred to the Korematsu decision of 1944. And Fred Korematsu was not alone. There were two others, Min Yasui and Gordon Hirabayashi. And Gordon actually uh, was a, became a Canadian, and he taught at the University of Edmonton. And uh, he was involved in the redress campaign with with me and others. Anyway, um, the decision of the U.S. Supreme Court said that it was uh, all right to incarcerate uh, Japanese Americans as a group because it was for national security reasons, but it wouldn't have been all right if it was simply on racial grounds. And so uh, following that uh, decision in 1944, Japanese Americans who signed a, uh, an oath of allegiance to the United States were able to leave the camps that they were in. And uh, a friend of mine, Dale Minami, who is a, a lawyer in San Francisco, he um, appealed this decision, the uh, Korom Matsu and Hirabayashi and Yasui decisions, and uh, Judge Patel of the uh, North California bench reversed those decisions as being uh, incorrect and wrong. It's interesting to me how uh, Japanese American um, internment incarceration is now becoming part of the news because of uh, the President Trump and his actions. And uh, for the last month, we've been hearing about children uh, being held in cages. And uh, uh, Mrs. Bush actually said it brought back memories of uh, Japanese American incarcerations that started in 1941. And it was her husband, uh, President Bush, who uh, resisted uh, pressure from p people in his cabinet who uh, were, this is post 9-11, were discussing whether or not that kind of action should take place with uh, Muslim uh, Americans. And actually around the table with President Bush was a Japanese American, Mi uh, Norm Mineta, who at the age of 10 had been incarcerated at, uh, at uh, Heart Mountain. And uh, when they were discussing this, President Bush looked at Norm and he said, well, Norm's here, so we can't possibly do that. Anyway, uh, 38 years ago, uh, when I was a young uh, idealistic lawyer, I got involved with my association, the National Association of Japanese Canadians, and we had the audacious hope of uh, getting redress for what had happened during uh, the war years and afterwards. And it was outrageous, outrageous in a sense, uh, because we were a very small minority and we had no friends in high places and we had uh, no money. Uh, but we took our case to the Canadian people and we made Japanese Canadian redress a Canadian issue. 
And I'm happy uh, to say that uh, Canadians stepped up and supported our claim. And actually, in 1989, so that's a year after the settlement, only 12% of Canadians opposed uh, what it, the redress settlement. And in my view, there's not too many things that only 12% of Canadians don't support. So I think it was a, overwhelmingly supported by Canadians. Surprising to me, um, I was uh, asked this um, February to be involved in the British Columbia Japanese Canadian Redress campaign. In 2012, Christy Clark of the Liberals apologized to the Japanese Canadian community. Actually, it was a campaign thing pre-election and she apologized to almost everybody. And we were just one of those groups. But with the new government uh, in BC, they uh, had a meeting with our community last fall. And um, in April, uh, two of the um, ministers plus the premier met with the leaders of the BC communities. And I was asked if I would be on the advisory committee with um, Art Miki. That's Art Miki right here with Prime Minister Mulroney signing the, uh, the settlement agreement. Now, Art and I are on this advisory committee 30 years post-1988. Uh, and I thought, well, uh, how can I help? And I thought the best way I could help was to make a video. And I'd never made a video before. And I didn't realize what was really involved. Uh, but... Um, so I hope you'll be kind <laughs> when you watch it. I was told that all you need to do is make a slideshow and put it on uh, Apple computer iMovie. And um, that's pretty much what I did. Anyway, I had uh, what, I, what this video is, is for my community to, to discuss what kind of measures they think would be appropriate for, as the, as the British Columbia government calls it, post um, apology measures, PAM, and, uh, and for us to talk about it and look over the history, also to show to government and also hopefully uh, to everybody in Canada. And uh, it's on uh, YouTube. My video is called Swimming Upstream. Um, Grassella, Joy Coke, <laughs> I, I phoned Joy. I said, what do you think I should call this video? And she said, oh, think fish. So... <laughs> So I thought, okay, swimming upstream. Anyway, it's on YouTube, and uh, it's also on the Canadian Race Relations Foundation website as well as some other websites. So uh, I hope that um, you will um, tell others to uh, take a look at it. Thank you. In the late 19th century, thousands of Japanese immigrants from a feudal island arrived on these shores to help clear the forest, harvest the seas, and develop the wealth of a young country. What they met was white hostility. In 1895, British Columbia denied Asian people and First Nations people the rights of citizenship. In 1900, Tommy Homa challenged this law. He won in the BC courts, but the province appealed to England's Privy Council and succeeded, preserving its power to deny their vote to Asians and First Nations. Decades of tension and fear of the Yellow Peril erupted when angry whites mobbed Vancouver's Japantown area. Despite the racism, Japanese Canadians continued to thrive in fishing, logging, mining, and farming. They established businesses and raised families.
Canada declared war on Japan after the December 7, 1941 bombing of Pearl Harbor. The War Measures Act was invoked and applied to those of Japanese ancestry, as it had been against German and Italian Canadians in 1939. However, by comparison, German and Italian Canadians were largely unaffected. Those with Japanese ancestry were branded as enemy aliens, ordered to carry ID cards, be fingerprinted, and registered. BC wanted more. All levels of BC governments conspired to expel Japanese Canadians and expropriate their property from the protected area 100 miles inland from the coast. Now is the time to address British Columbia's responsibility and leadership role in ethnic cleansing, property dispossession, and community destruction. Some powerful forces spoke against the removal. The Army's Lieutenant Governor Ken Stewart reported, I cannot see that they constitute the slightest menace to national security. RCMP Assistant Commissioner Frederick Mead agreed, no fear of sabotage need be expected from the Japanese in Canada. The Prime Minister's Executive Assistant, Jack Pickersgill, confirmed, I don't think that there was a member of cabinet who honestly believed that the Japanese were dangerous. It was a British Columbia problem. Initially, Ottawa resisted taking more extreme measures. Despite no evidence of a security risk, BC politicians began a concerted campaign to cleanse the province of Japanese Canadians. In January 1942, Premier John Hart appointed Cabinet Minister George Pearson to lead a BC delegation to Ottawa where they joined forces with Federal Cabinet Minister Ian McKenzie to demand the uprooting of all, including women and children. Responsible politicians were BC Federal MP Robert Mayhew, along with Ministers Royal Maitland and Harry Perry, CCF leader Harold Winch, and MLA Alan Neal. MP McKenzie went on public record stating, it is the government's plan to get these people out of BC as fast as possible. It is my personal intention, as long as I remain in public life, to see they never come back here. In the end, Ottawa conceded to BC's demands. On February 24th, 1942, by ordering, all persons of the Japanese race are to leave the protected area. The order was executed quickly. The BC Security Commission, a federal agency, directed the uprooting, dispersal, and incarceration. It involved BC Representative John Shiras and MLAs Maitland, Pearson, and Winch. The camps were often erroneously referred to as internment camps. The Geneva Conventions state a country cannot intern its own nationals, only enemy foreigners. BC refused to pay for children's education a provincial obligation. The camps relied largely on religious groups and their own resources. 
More than 2,600 men in 24 labor camps along the Trans-Canada built roads in the interior. The last camp closed in March 1946. To hasten the removal of families from the province, the BC Security Commission advertised these laborers as both industrious and loyal. Resistors to the breakup of families were sent to a POW camp in Ontario. In 1943, George Collins, chair of BC Security Commission, ordered, these people will be dispersed across Canada in small groups and exiled from BC. In contrast, Japanese Americans were allowed to return to their homes and businesses before the end of the war. However, in 1945, Canada, at the urging of BC politicians, forced all Japanese Canadians to choose between moving east of the Rockies or being shipped to Japan. In the end, 13,000 people were sent east and 4,000 were exiled to Japan. The BC government and the city of Vancouver colluded with the custodian of enemy property in the dispossession. Vancouver City Council wanted to redevelop the Powell Street area. The city urged Glenn McPherson, the custodian's Vancouver representative, to sell all Japanese Canadian homes and businesses in that area. McPherson collaborated with the BC's Municipal Affairs Minister, Edward Bridgman, to obtain municipal property assessment records. Then. McPherson met with Vancouver officials to discuss their interest in acquiring properties. In January 1943, despite Ottawa's initial reluctance, Cabinet bowed to BC pressure and granted the custodian of enemy property the right to dispose of everything without Japanese Canadians' consent. BC judges Sidney Smith and David Whiteside approved each forced sale. The proceeds from the sales paid for the incarceration contrary to the Geneva Conventions. In the U.S., there was no seizure or sale of property. Gone was Vancouver's Japantown, the geographical heart of the community, where the pulse was felt, where more than 8,000 people lived, worked, and played. 59 language schools in the province were closed. Education was disrupted. Vibrant business communities were wiped out. Future generations lost touch with their heritage, resulting in the loss of language and culture. Prime Minister Mackenzie King declared in 1944, it is a fact that no person of the Japanese race born in Canada has been charged with any act of sabotage or disloyalty during the years of the war. But post-war BC continued its racist policies. BC reaffirmed the denial of the vote to Japanese Canadians and First Nations in March 1947. In 1948, BC's Premier Brian Johnson prevented Japanese Canadians from returning to the coast. BC agreed to pay half of the cost of their continued exile. 
In the same year, the province reimposed a 1902 ban that prevented Japanese Canadians from working as loggers on Crown lands. Slowly, the tide changed, and in April 1949, Japanese Canadians won the rights of citizenship through a national political campaign. Almost 40 years later, honor was restored with the signing of the redress settlement with the federal government. The terms included $21,000 to each survivor, $12 million to a community fund, and $24 million for a race relations foundation. I would like to introduce Joy Kogawa, uh, who is here with us today, and Jam 3, the two uh, stars, <laughs> Jason and, uh, and Dirk. Uh, do, why don't you all come up and um, tell us about your exciting new project, okay, East of the Rockies. This project is uh, very important to Dirk and I. It's called East of the Rockies, and it really began last March, um, when there was a lot of celebration around Canada 150. And um, I make a joke that Dirk hates, but like if you were watching television programming at that time, there's like a lot of self-congratulatory navel gazing uh, spearheaded by, you know, every person in Canada about Canada the beautiful, Canada the fair. And uh, Dirk, who had least recently immigrated from Holland, was like, oh, that's pretty cool. And I told him, you know, we do some bad stuff too. And I started to tell him about the internment of Japanese Canadians and, uh, and this book that I had read in high school, Obasan, uh, and what an impact that it had on me and how much I loved it. And I offered to lend him the book. And then Dirk immediately was like, we have to, what did you say? We was like, we should make a project about this. This is a story. We need to do it. Um, uh, we need to produce it. We need to talk to Jam 3. We need to talk to our colleagues at the NFB. There's something here. There's all this wonderful new technology coming out that's such a powerful tool to educate like an entirely new generation of Canadians. This is the perfect kind of launch pad for that. Uh, and then Dirk was like, well, we should reach out to Joy Kagawa, where she live. And I was like, oh, Google search. She lives in, in Toronto. <laughs> she lives down the street from our office. Uh, that's cool. Oh, her email address is here. And then I just kind of cold called Joy Kagawa, an author who I'd looked up to since I was 15. And uh, I was like, hey, I have this idea. Have you played a video game before? And she was like, no. Um, but that sounds cool. Let's have lunch. And then Joy, you should really take it from there. <laughs> because we met at Taroni downtown and just Dirk and I, and we're like, I remember we got there early intentionally so that we could tell them to turn the music down in the restaurant because they had like a noon DJ. It was the most ridiculous job in the entire world, by the way. I'm sorry if anybody's relatives is a DJ at a restaurant at noon in Toronto. And I was like, turn it down. You know, I'm very nervous about meeting her. And uh, Joy shows up wearing like the hippest like <laughs> denim jumper and a Fitbit. And I'm like, oh, this is going to be fine. <laughs> And then we started talking about our passion for the project and this concept around augmented reality, um, which had just been announced and that Jam 3 was fortunate enough uh, to have like early access to and have uh, some experience 
in the field of augmented reality and our vision for this project that I had already dubbed East of the Rockies. Um, and Joy was like, oh, that's a pretty good name. Uh, and then she literally did the rest of it. Like it was like a bunch of brainstorming sessions where she created um, characters out of thin air, gave them names, gave them backstories, and really just drew from her experience and um, the experience of uh, the community that she's been working so hard to reconnect uh, since 1949. What we wanted to do, and also before going into the slides and also passing the mic to Joy, uh, is that we wanted to tell a story, especially for me as a European, uh, this is like the Canadian saved Holland. This is the only thing uh, I knew. So what we wanted to do is actually create a platform where we could tell this story to everybody globally, but also get it into the hands of younger people. Uh, because I think it's, it's, it's not a forgotten story, but it's not told enough. So that's what we wanted to do with uh, this story. And then there's a video which we want to show, which um, is a short uh, trailer which we worked on. It's still a work in progress. We're not done yet. But it gives you, gives you an idea of uh, the, pro the project itself. Yeah. Um, and before I play the video, uh, I just wanted to sh highlight this slide to thank all of the partners that have made it possible. Uh, from the CRRF who've been involved in helping us craft it to the NFB who have been our long, long time uh, production partners and who have graciously agreed to co-produce this with us as well as the landscape of justice for help adding uh, much needed validity and assisting with research. me Yuki. Months after the attack on Pearl Harbor, my family left our home for the last time. I was 17 years old. We're in Bay Farm Camp, sharing a 16 by 16 hut with another woman, Maria, and her twin babies. Before dad was taken away, he said he didn't think women and kids would have to leave, but if we did, he said we should only take what we could not part with. Dad was happy to see we'd brought the small record player. Every night before bed, he sits with his eyes closed and listens. I think he's pretending we're home. You don't realize what you take for granted until it's gone. There are moments when I look at the mountains, and it's so beautiful I could cry. Then I remember why we're here, and I do. So yeah, this is work in progress, but it gives you an, an idea of, of the technology itself. So this is an AR experience. So basically what we're doing is we're creating a hologram on a table and people can follow a story in their own uh, way. Uh, and because it's a new technology, it's a little bit more immersive, we believe it's, it's a good medium to tell the story itself. So that's the first time I've, saw, I've seen this. It's, uh, <laughs> well, there were more people involved than just me in this story. There's a whole row yeah, over there. Yeah, very talented yeah. producers and developers. So, <laughs> um, what can I say? I mean, uh, life, is, life is exciting and interesting and surprising, and you fall into it, and that's what I did. I fell into these two guys. And in the background, all those other people. And so something is happening when you fall into things. It, somebody said, some friend said to me, um, when he was walking along and he picked up some garbage, and he said, well, if it's in front of you and you see it and it has to be done, then you do it. <laughs> so in a way, um, I'm inclined to say yes before no to a lot of things because well, my, my attitude is that um, if I can't do it, I can hand it over and let it be. So um, in a way, um, saying yes to something that I didn't understand at all or know what it was or know where it was going or anything was one of the foolish things 
that has turned out. And life is like that. You go along and you never really know what's going to happen. You might think you're intending something really good and it turns out horrible, or you might intend something not good and it turns out after all it was okay. So we can't predict what's going to happen. Um, and so I, I just walk through life kind of trusting, essentially. And, um, and, and for me, that's the only thing I have to do, is just trust it. Um, it's kind of walking instinctively. It's, um, so, so, it's, uh, so life is um, pretty constantly exciting. It's so unboring, really. America's video is going to be shown again at an event that some of us put together. Um, the event is called We Should Know Each Other because Japanese Canadians, by and large, across the country, isolated, did not grow up knowing each other. I was part of that whole thing of being the only Jap in town. So this now, We Should Know Each Other, is happening, and on July 7, We Should Know Each Other is happening again at 49 Donlands, right opposite the Donlands subway at 3 o'clock, and you're all invited to come. If you want to be on our mailing list, we'll have uh, a, a sign-up sheet over there, and it'll be on the reception table. So um, at the We Should Know Each Other event, not only will the video be shown, but we will have panelists. Frank Moritsugu, who is a Nisei, he's 94, um, but he knows the whole thing deeply. And he'll be talking as well as Lynn Kobayashi, who's a sansei, who's also here, and uh, Kari Kimoto, who's a yonsei, and she will speak. And they will all be speaking, really essentially, about what their values are, what they came from, what they now, what matters. You know, what matters is what we believe so deeply that it defines who we are. And when you have come through that, then the question is, what are your values now? What matters the most to you now? So we would like this discussion amongst us all. And so if I can just say one more thing, that at this stage in my life, what the value that has come to me, that matters to me for the rest of my walk, is a word that's not very popular. It's not, it's not, anyway, the word is forgiveness. I want that as desperately as life for not just Japanese Canadians, but for everybody. And I want to work for that. Thank you very much. And the um, good people from Jam3. Uh, I just want to say that this is a wonderful program that, that we've seen. And um, before we continue the celebration uh, for the Multiculturalism Day, uh, just a few things that I wish to bring to your attention. First of all, um, I have a request from um, Lynn Kobayashi from the National Association of Japanese Canadians. Um, she wants to announce the Japanese Canadians Gala, am I correct? November 8th, Thursday. So mark the day and watch out for more information. Exactly, and leave it out at the reception table. People can contact her directly for it. I know there are so many um, commemoration events that's happening this year. You know, some in Winnipeg, I guess, and some in uh, Vancouver. So, you know, it's a great opportunity for people to learn about what happened and you know, 30 years later, what has been accomplished. Um, I, I just want to make a few announcements as well for the CLRF. Uh, we have two uh, studies, research studies, one with Environics and one with Angus Reid, um, on polling the uh, attitudes of Canadians. Uh, we just finished them this year, one early in February uh, and March, released in March, and one uh, it's going to be released in uh, in July. And so we invite you to two webinars that will be on our website. Uh, please sign up for them. They are free. And uh, if 
I hope you can join them during the webinar. You know, uh, uh, Dr. Keith Newman from Environics will talk about this, the study that he's done with the, in partnership with the CLRF. And uh, Sachi Kuro from Angus Reid will be talking about uh, the one um, that she has done again with CLRF. And that was devoted on um, uh, the Muslim community. So, um, also, we have an award of excellence uh, program that will be, um, uh, we will uh, announce the winners in September 27 in a gala in Winnipeg. And you can self nominate or nominate other people. And the deadline is the, the 9 o'clock a.m. on uh, July 3rd. That is right after the long weekend. So if you are interested, you know, the, the categories could be media, could be um, uh, education, could be uh, community uh, organizations, and, and so on. This is our, our for our community uh, organizations. So again, you are encouraged to go to our website and check out the um, the uh, award of excellence uh, to to see if uh, you might have um, somebody in mind or self nominate if you have a project that you feel very proud of that can improve race relations and look for people like us with the red dot. You know these are people from our office and if you want more information and also we have government um, category as well. Suppose you are with the uh, of the force with the police force or whatever that. Uh, has been doing great work to improve uh, race relations, um, you can also self-nominate. Um, uh, again, as mentioned by Joy Kogawa, you know, the, please do the uh, sign up on the uh, registration table for the Japanese Canadians for Social Justice mailing list so that you get more information. Uh, remember that uh, we are a charitable foundation, and uh, so feel free to be generous. And there's always a donation box when we have an event or on our website. So feel free to do that, and we'd be happy to issue tax receipts for your generosity. And uh, finally, we want to thank uh, once again the Federation of Asian Canadian Lawyers, uh, the Ontario Bar Association, uh, notably their diversity um, officer, Chris Chung, for providing the room and um, all the technical support and catering help in making the event successful. And uh, I also would like to acknowledge the presence of Lynn Kobayashi, who is also a sponsor for this event uh, from the National Association of Japanese Canadians for their ongoing support and for her presence today. So, um, uh, in addition, I would, it would be remiss if I did not thank the speakers and presenters, Kat Krieger for opening our ceremony, Mike Doy for co emceeing with me, uh, Simmer, who's uh, just left from this um, Heritage Canada, the Honorable Justice Mariko Masu, wonderful um, presentation of the, the film. You, you are natural for filmmaking. <laughs> That's your second career. <laughs> Uh, the teams from Jam Three for you know so many are coming out to to um, hear the stories uh, and Joy Kogawa for the and her you know being so um, uh, been doing these things for so long let me put it that way falling in life for so long which is good uh, for the for tonight's program so I would urge you we have a reception that is. Um, uh, for your enjoyment, and please um, uh, stay around if you like to uh, watch the second presentation uh, that we didn't have time to in the in the main program. Uh, that is the the, the uh, film called the Redress, uh, Children of Redress, and uh, is is made by Greg Masuda. Okay, thank you, everyone. <laughs> <laughs>